Good evening. This is a Wednesday night Bible study. We didn't have a Bible study last week. Uh, we had a couple couple issues going on, but no big deal. We are back for this week. We're going to do a quick study here today. Uh, just a quick one here on Matthew chapter number 5. If you have your Bible, let's turn to Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 20. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to a Mormon this week. Uh, I talked to him for about two hours. Uh, he is a vendor of mine uh, with one of the companies I work with, and he's out in Utah. And I said to him, I said, hey, are you, uh, are you a Mormon? He goes, well, yeah. And I said, yeah, I, I figured, you know, you're out in Utah, you know, bring him young, way to make, you know, generalizations, but it's just how it is. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get it. So we talked for two hours about it. And it was a really good conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll save that for another sermon, but I will tell you that it, uh, it pays to be prepared. Uh, that discussion is never easy, uh, but I did ask him some really pointed questions in regards to uh, eternal life, in regards to justification, in regards to the scripture, and how it correlates with the Book of Mormon. And the biggest issue I came to is, I said, you know, do I need to believe the Book of Mormon? He says, yes, absolutely. I said, is it imperative that I join the Mormon church in order to get to heaven? He says, yes, it is. And I said, so would you say that I'm going to hell? Well, you know, he wouldn't answer the question about that, and he was a little bit, you know, skittish on that front. And I understand that he doesn't want to, you know, say, "Oh, you're going to hell." Uh, but I asked him the simple question. He said, "Well, I said, give me the the gist of the Mormonism faith." And he goes through, and he he basically said, you know, from the time of uh, the, the ascension of Jesus Christ, uh, there was apostate, you know, people that came from after Christ, and pretty much as soon as all the apostles were dead, it was it was dead. It's all apostasy. Tons of denominations, and from the time of you know, roughly 90 or 100 AD till <clears throat> 1820, 1826, it was just apostasy, right? And so I said, uh, I yeah, so I, well, that's part of the, that's one of the questions I asked him. I said to him, though, I said, well, 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 let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the scripture is the word of God? Well, yes. And, and you guys use the King James version of the scripture. He says, yes, yes, we do. And I said, okay, so if you guys use the King James version of the scripture um, and that you believe that truth was restored, that there was a revelation of Joseph, from Joseph Smith or of, of Jesus Christ to Joseph Smith and that he, he and John the Baptist and Peter and everybody else laid hands on him and, and, and commissioned him to be a prophet, yes, and write another testament of Jesus Christ, yes. So that would need to be in line with the King James version of the Bible, right? Yes, okay. So my question, though, is if there's all this apostasy, how do we write the King James Bible in 1611? Who wrote that? Must have been apostate people, right? And he's like, uh, it's pretty funny. He says, I'm going to send a missionary to your house. Is that okay? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm going to send one that really knows the Bible. <laughs> I said, good. So, I mean, I re we really hit him hard on, on a lot of fronts. And I, I think he really listened, and I, it was a very good conversation. But I left him, you know, with the, the issue. Is he first thing he said to me as, is he says, the very first thing, he said, tell me what it is to be a Mormon. He goes, well, number one, I want to make sure it's really clear that, that Mormons are Christians. That's what he wanted to make very clear. You know, right in the beginning, Mormons are Christians, and people say that Mormons are not Christians. So I'm going to preach a sermon on this coming up. It's something that I want to go over, because, of course, in our two-hour discussion, we cover just about everything. But uh, a lot of what they discuss is you know, self-righteousness, and self-righteousness is the concept or the idea that Jesus Christ here in Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 20, is getting to, right? When Jesus Christ in Matthew 5 and verse number 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. The reason why he says that is because it's going to go through people's minds that, what are you talking about? These are weird blessings. Or, 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 what, what, are, you gonna, are you coming here just to get rid of the law? Because really, they want to get rid of the law. The law is, is condemnation. It's death. It's the wrath of God. So they want it gone. And so when he says, Think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And he says that, you know, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass through the law, till all be fulfilled. I said to myself, you know what that really is, what Christ is really doing, is he's quoting what Paul says over in the book of Romans, in, uh, in chapter, if you read Romans chapter number 3, uh, read this with me here for a second. Romans chapter 3, in verse number uh, 31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. See, what Jesus Christ came to do is he came to establish the law. He came to establish the law correctly, okay? They had been taught Moses' law, but they'd been taught it in a, in a way in which there was not a pure understanding from the perspective of Jesus Christ about that law. And that is to say, as we see here in chapter number uh, 5, verse 20, for I say unto you, what this is, is this is Jesus Christ's statement Declarative statements. Declarative statements are what? They're statements of fact. 
right? Is there any question here about what he's saying? No, he's making a statement that is declarative. And when I talked to that Mormon guy, I kept saying, well, Jesus said, do, 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 right? I'd say, well, Christ made it very clear that this. And he goes, yeah, but this, this, this. I said, no, no, it's not, he's not saying and do that. He's saying, and I gave him lots of verses. I said, well, how, how about, how about uh, John 6, 36? He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he goes, yes, but believe on the Son means, and he says, doesn't uh, mean this. And he goes through the following things. It means you must be water baptized. You must be X, Y, and Z. And I said, well, that's interesting. How about the thief on the cross just as an example? I mean, he didn't get water baptized. He, you know, oh, that's interesting. that's interesting. So, you know, we went back and forth. But when Christ says, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he's using the law and establishing it. Where is the law supposed to do? It's supposed to go against a person. It is contrary to person. You look at a person, you say, yeah, he's guilty underneath the law. You put him up to it. It's that schoolmaster. You put him on the law. You have to show him the law in order to bring him to Christ. You have to show him the need for what Christ is going to offer to him, not just today, but back then as well. If Jesus Christ seek to, came to seek and to save the lost, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he came to do that in a method in which he took the law and he said, then do it. That's what it's been there to do, then do it. And he's establishing the law. The same thing that Paul says, you know, by faith, we establish the law. The law, as Paul says, is not of faith, right? Very clearly he says that in Galatians. The law is not of faith. It's not, it's not a faith issue. It's a works issue. So when he's telling them, he's directing them. For I say unto you, declaring that accept, right? Accept means that there's no other way around this. This is the requirement that accept your righteousness. Your meaning that that personal pronoun, which is making you look at yourself, right? He's not saying unless everybody's. No, he's saying except, except your. So the, the issue is look at you, look at you, and do what? He says, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I want to make it clear that to compare yourselves, as Paul says, uh, go over with me to the book of, of 2 Corinthians, please, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And read in verse number 12 what Paul says about the comparison of yourselves among yourselves, okay? Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse number 12. He says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number. That means that there's a lot of people, there's a number of people who are doing what? He says, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. So what are you doing? He says, there's no need to just go around and say, oh, look at me and look at you and look at me and look at you. And I'm better or you're worse or you better do better things or he's, he can be highly commended and this guy's not as highly commended. He says, we dare not make ourselves the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they do what? They measuring themselves by themselves. That is... I'm going to see how faithful I am by looking at so-and-so. I'm going to see how, how, um, how good I am compared to so-and-so, right? He says, those that do that and compare themselves among themselves are not wise, right? And the reason why you're not wise is you're looking at an imperfect standard. The standard is imperfect. It's not, a, it's not the accurate standard. That standard varies from person to person. What is good to John, you know, might not be good to so-and-so. What might be good to this guy might not be good to this guy. What he might think is sin is not sin to that. That's why you have to come back to the standard of righteousness that God is going to lay out right here in which he says that accept your righteousness and then he's going to do this. He's going to make a comparison. He's going to make a comparison between people. What is that? Is it foolishness? Yes. So what is he trying to do? Is he really saying that your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Well, this is a teaching point, isn't it, of Christ? Isn't this a point in which he's, he's saying that? But if he said, so wait, if my righteousness exceeds, then I'm going to get into the kingdom of heaven? Well, yeah. How, how, do they, how are they reconciling that? Well, number one, nobody's thinking that they're going to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. No one in their mind is going to sit there as they hear Christ say, unless your righteousness exceeds... You would enter. Nobody's going to say, okay, yeah, I'm fine. What are they going to do? They're going to say, well, that's impossible. Who's going to do that? Who can do that? Well, this is, this is ridiculous. This is, this is crazy, right? 
Don't you remember over in the book of Matthew chapter number 19 and verse number, uh, look at, read verse number 19, chapter 19. This is the, the story of the rich young ruler. And look what he says again. He says in verse number 19 and verse number uh, 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. So I could use that verse and just say, Ha, 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 rich men don't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's really hard for rich men to enter. Well, that's not really the point. What is the true point of that? The true point is that rich men don't enter the kingdom because they do not do what? What is the full complete thought? The full complete thought is that they do not enter the kingdom because they trust in riches as opposed to trusting in God. So again, he says, look, he says, again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now you would say, well, that sounds crazy, right? Because in the, in the eyes of a Jew in there, during that time, wealth, prosperity meant blessing from God. Wealth, prosperity, my blessing. So if I'm wealthy, if I'm a rich man, that means God looked down and, and shined his face favorably on me. And now I sit here and go, well, what do you mean? This is really hard. Who, why, who, well, what's the obvious question? Well, then it basically says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed. Note the word, exceedingly amazed. <laughs> why? Because they are thinking that riches and wealth is good. And so he says here, who then can be saved? This is the prime time which Christ could have said, just keep the law. No. What does he say to them? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible. That's the issue. It's impossible for a man. If you take the standard of men and place yourselves against yourselves, that's, that's, that's idiotic. That's foolishness to do that. When you, when you take yourselves and you compare yourselves to the all-righteous law, aha, Aha, that's how you do it, right? That's when you, Christ is ultimately trying to get people not to see their righteousness. He's trying to get them to see what? The righteousness of the law. That's what he's trying to get them to see. He's trying to see and show them their unrighteousness. Now, how do you show somebody their unrighteousness? Well, you compare it to something that's righteous. And so in their little pea brains, the, the things that they know are righteous are what they see. They see people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they think of them as being righteous. But what is the truth of that? Matthew 23. Matthew 23. And read this. Matthew 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. We talked about that before. Moses' seat is a seat of judgment. You can read back through the Exodus and what they did. He says, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. Because what are they teaching? Well, as their manner was, as their custom was, what did they do? They read the law. They sat in there and they read the law. Now, they didn't understand the law. They didn't practice the law, but they read it. And he says, that observe and do, but do not after their works. For they say and do not, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works, note this, all their works they do for to be seen of men. Comparison of who? I'm better than that guy. I'm not like that other guy. This isn't me. Uh, this Me compared to this guy is, is ugh, what, a, what a peon. He says, they make broad their philosophies and, and, and they enlarge the borders of their garments and they love the uppermost rooms and the feasts. All they care about is what? Look at this. And greetings in the markets and to be called by men. Rabbi, rabbi, teacher, teacher, feed my ego. Now notice what he says in verse number. We can go through the rest of this stuff, but look at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That verse compared to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 20 demonstrates that Christ is proving a point, right? He's got a deeper motive to what he's saying here. He's not just saying, go be more righteous than the other guy and then you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what people will tell you that he's saying. Just like when he tells the rich young ruler, go keep the law and the commandments, he's telling him that as if people would say, see, Jesus said, I can, I can show you a preacher. Uh, yeah, Ronnie's his name. He's up. He's a Grace Church, Dispensational Grace Church. He preaches. He says that Jesus Christ preaches the law and that people need to keep the law to get eternal life. And during his earthly ministry, I said that's not what he's doing at all. He says, "Well, what about what about you know Mark nine and, and, and Matthew twenty or, as, or nineteen? If you just read with the rich young ruler, he says that he's got to go keep the commandments because what's he doing? 
what does the guy have to see? He has to see righteousness, but he has to see his unrighteousness. He's got to put that law upon him. And once he puts that law upon him, then he comes to that conclusion that some of the other disciples said this, who then can be saved? Who can be saved? Good. That's the point which you understand that with men, it is impossible. It is impossible to generate righteousness. It is impossible to do anything that will please God in the flesh. And as you see here in Matthew chapter 23, this is what's the, the clarification of this whole issue. It's foolishness what Christ is doing to compare them to the scribes and Pharisees. But that's what they do. So he's like, I say unto you, think about that for a second. Think about it. Can can you even can you even can you even contemplate you being more righteous than those guys? They 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 would say no, right? They would say those guys are more righteous than me. I will never make it more like them, right? Doesn't Paul say it's concerning the law, blameless, touching zeal, persecuting the church, as touching the righteousness in the law, he was blameless. Philippians three. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Look at this, hypocrites, for you shut up. Notice this, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. So just go back to Matthew 5, 20, and we'll wrap this up. He says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteous of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Not once is he saying that the scribes and the Pharisees enter the kingdom of heaven. We know that they don't. Right there he says, For ye shall have the kingdom of heaven against men. For in verse 13 of chapter 23, he says, For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And we'll look next week, and we're going to pick up. This is just a, this is a little taste as to what we're going to get into. We're going to get into the reasons why he makes this statement. To show you the true intentions. Christ says, ye have heard, but I say unto you. Ye have heard, but I say unto you. And those declarative statements are a fuller, perfect picture of the understanding of the law that they must have to gain the respect for the righteousness that's in the law so they can ultimately do what? Say, impossible, I can't keep it. And at that point in time, God says, what's impossible with men is possible to God. And that's to exercise faith, to believe in Jesus Christ. And he says, you should know the truth. The truth shall set you free. You're free from the law. Wow, really? And then we'll go through and look at Second Corinthians chapter 3 and the rest. So uh, let's go and close in a prayer.